can. Hi, I am Jen, the Infection Control Manager for St. Mary's Medical Center. I am here to discuss the infection prevention strategies um, for all five facilities. When there is a difference between the different facilities, I will try to alert you to that, but please always verify the processes at your at each individual facility. I have um, I've been a nurse for over 25 years. I hold infection prevention. Um, I'm very passionate about it, but I still hold bedside nursing very near and dear to me. We're going to start off with watching a little video. Um, please, uh, I, I don't like technology. This is new to me, so I apologize in the beginning if it seems like if I'm a little glitchy. Um, there is a little video that I would like you to watch. Please place yourself in the young lady's shoes. Imagine it being your mom, your sister, your best friend, whoever is the most important person to you, and see how you would feel in the very end. In a hospital boardroom somewhere in America. The case of Whitney Ross. What went wrong? In a way, I think we all wish that the result of her case had been related to her appendicitis. But it wasn't. So what went wrong? And what can we do to fix it? Whitney was a sophomore in college. An excellent student, dreams and goals. She came to be in post-op after having an appendectomy. Still doing a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this IV line still really hurts. Well, like I said, I can try moving it to the other arm. Yeah, whatever you could do. Sure. Is that a rash? Oh, my cat scratched me a few days ago. I told them when they took my history. Okay. It shouldn't be a problem if the IV is down by the wrist. Thanks. Sorry to be such a bother. I'll be back in just a minute. Okay. The probable source of the infection was down the hall. Tom wasn't even supposed to still be there, but he contracted a MRSA infection at his surgical site. His daughter, Kelly, unfortunately didn't understand that even though she was just a visitor, she was also a part of the healthcare team. Hey, uh, my dad could use an extra pillow for his back. Okay, I'll bring you one in just a second. Kelly had been educated by a nurse about the barrier precautions and the dangers of healthcare associated infections, but she didn't quite grasp how just one lapse can cause infection to spread. Dina? She was a good nurse, but was burned out with stresses at work and home. I know you're always busy with all the paperwork you're doing, but if you could get to us soon. She wasn't going the extra mile to ensure the safety of patients. I just need another minute or two, and then I will bring you a pillow. Yes. Okay, thanks. She recognized Kelly wasn't using the gloves correctly, but didn't use the opportunity to educate and didn't take personal responsibility for cleaning a potentially contaminated surface. Uh, Whitney's IV still hurts. I'm going to try moving it to the other arm. Can you cover Mr. Daniels for a few minutes? Yeah, I wasn't going to finish this anyway. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Nathan, he was the director of the post-op unit. He'd come back from a conference on patient safety and infection control, motivated to make a difference. But he never instituted a sustained effort. Real change never happened. So an otherwise responsible new nurse just out of school never got the message. She was using gloves, so she didn't also feel the need to wash her hands. Nathan staff did everything right when he was around. But there was no sense of ownership, no real change. There wasn't 100% commitment. Oh, that's so much better. Thank you. Let me know if there's anything else you need. Okay. Um, straight A's this semester and a million dollars. <laughs> Okay, set your sights a little lower, just buzz. <laughs> the infection preventionist working with post-op was Janice. Janice couldn't successfully implement a team approach to infection prevention. Hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Why? What's wrong? She was always considered an outsider. Nothing's wrong. I just wanted to follow up with you on some ideas. She lacked the skills to successfully coach staff members, and so everyone's awareness of healthcare-associated infections suffered as a result. Is it cold in here? I don't think so. But I can get you another blanket. Good. The nurse made a note in the chart, but didn't alert anyone until after shift change. Temperature is 101, blood pressure 145 over 97, nothing moving in her GI tract, hypoactive bowel sounds. Looks like it's ileus. Hmm. Guess she's staying another day. Let's see what Dr. Kennedy says. Thanks. Manuel? In his third year of med school, he longed to make a difference. A temp of 101 is fairly typical for appendicitis. Let's monitor the postoperative ileus for 24 hours. But the patient got worse. She's been acting a little confused, but her temperature went back down. What concerns me is her arm. 
Look, Manuel had been watching the case all day. He suspected the patient's condition was getting much worse. I saw that. But it's here in her history. Her cat scratched her arm and she got a rash. Did you read her history, Manuel? Let's stick Dr. With Kennedy you. directed the team to continue the antibiotics already prescribed for her appendectomy and closely monitor her condition. Monitor for peritonitis. I'm on call this weekend. Alert me if she doesn't respond. But Manuel's rotation in post-op was almost over and he didn't want to stick his neck out. Manuel accepted the attending's course of action without objection. When it came time to make a difference, he didn't speak up, even though the problem was staring him in the face. 48 hours later, the nursing assistant took Whitney's vitals at shift change, including a temperature of 97 and blood pressure of 90 over 60. But Manuel just recorded it and never related to the nurse or bothered Dr. Kennedy because it was the weekend. It was a chain of events that should not have happened. By the time she reached the ICU, she was suffering from organ failure as a result of sepsis. And then... Hey, Dr. Green. Um, everyone. The ICU just called me. Whitney from 204, she had a MRSA infection in her bloodstream. She passed away. I'll be around to talk with everyone, but... Any one of several individuals could have made a better decision, and Whitney might be alive today. She came in with appendicitis. But everyone knew that a patient had just died from poor infection prevention and poor communication. What's wrong? What could they say? They said what had too often been said. Nothing. Uh, how can I help you? No, my dad is asking about. What happened? Whitney joined countless others who have died of an infection acquired during their care. But you know what? It doesn't have to be like this. This is not reality. You have a second chance to go back in time and make new decisions as five of these characters. See if you can make choices that will change their approach to healthcare associated infections and prevent this outcome. Get it? This is you. This is you. This is you. This is you. And this is you. Go back in time and make better decisions so that this is you. Doctor said I healed up there. And not this. Take a walk in their shoes. If you're smart, we can improve quality of care and save patient lives. Go. So, yes, that video is a reenactment, but if you Google, you'll find very similar true stories all across the internet. So why are we concerned with infection control? HAIs increase or hospital choirs in infections increase the morbidity and mortality. They're the top leading cause of death in the United States. They kill more people than breast cancer and NVAs combined. 271 people die every day from hospital acquired infections. That is the census of St. Mary's Medical Center every single day. 100,000 estimated deaths every year. They increase the length of stay. Yes, there's many, there's probably about 1% of the population that likes three meals in a cot. But if we go and tell somebody that they have to stay an extra three, four days, or even two weeks because they need IV antibiotics because we gave them a hospital acquired infection, they're going to be angry. They have children at home, jobs, um, animals. They have all kinds of responsibilities outside of the hospital that they're not going to be very happy that we have to keep them here. They cost the hospital millions of dollars annually. One collapse costs a hospital approximately $50,000. What do you think that we could do with $50,000 for one bloodstream infection? Catheter-associated UTIs are about $14,000. Ventilator-associated pneumonias, $50,000. And one C. diff, $17,000. It's not that I like to make your lives miserable. This is all evidence-based data. The, um, these costs come from the AHRQ, which the website is there. They are publicly reported, which also reflects the facility's quality of care and alters the patient's family perception of our care. Even if we did everything right, say we had a young gentleman that coded and we inserted the central line under sterile technique, everybody washed their hands, and he survived that code and was able to walk around telling us how we saved him six weeks. If we gave him an infection, what do you think that he's truly going to remember and tell us about that infection? National patient safety goal number seven 
is infection prevention. It goes over hand hygiene, the multi-drug resistant organisms or the MDROs, central line bloodstream infections, which are also CLAPSIs, surgical site infections, SSIs, catheter associated UTIs, CAUDIs. I like you to hear the acronyms because then that way when you hear those, you know that it's related to infection control. This is evidence-based um, guidelines that we put into practice. Now, when I became a nurse 15, 25 years ago and I had to take micro. I didn't like micro. My teacher read the book to us and it just, I was not engaged in it. But what my f philosophy is, is if it doesn't belong there, how did it get there and what can we do to prevent it? What do you think is the number one way to prevent a spread of infection? If we look at this chain, hand hygiene is the number one way to prevent the spread of infection. And there's it's not just going into and out of every room. There are times when you're in the room that you must perform hand hygiene. That's why we have hand sanitizers outside of and inside of each room. Hand hygiene must be performed before entering and exiting the patient room or environment. Even if you don't intend to touch the patient, say you're there to pick them up for, to take them to radiology for a chest x-ray and you forgot the chart. You say, hey, I'm here to get you for your chest x-ray. I'll be right back. What happens? They see a face. Can you get me my water? Can you pick up my yucky call bell that's laying on the dirty floor? Can you walk me to the bathroom? Can you scratch my nose? So you have to be prepared for what the patient's intentions are, not necessarily what your intentions are. Because I don't see people saying, oops, sorry, my hands are dirty. Let me clean them first. We came into healthcare for a reason. We came in to take care of people. It's in our nature to just do things. So we need to be prepared ahead of time despite what we think we're going to do. We need to do it when we leave the room because many of us talk with our hands. We don't sit still. And actually, I'm having a very difficult time sitting still right now because I like to move. So we inadvertently touch things that we may not realize. And that room is an ex extension of the patient. So we need to make sure that we're leaving in the room what doesn't what's in the room and not bringing it out into the hall or to another patient. So we must do our hand hygiene when we leave the room. Before and after gloving. Gloves are not perfect. So that's just an extra layer of protection. Our first layer of protection is our hand hygiene. There's little micro holes in those gloves that could put you and the patient at risk. So you must do your hand hygiene before and after you take off the gloves. Immediately before an invasive procedure. An IV is an invasive procedure and let's talk about what we typically do. We gather our supplies, we do our hand hygiene, we walk into the room, we either raise the bed and use the patient's bed as our table or we sit next to the patient and then we put the tourniquet on, we palpate, we put our gloves on, we scrub the site, we might repalpate, and then we access. We should have, after we entered the room and got set up and figure out where we were going to um, insert the IV, remove our gloves, do hand hygiene, put fresh gloves on prior to that insertion. The bloodstream is a sterile site. You don't want to introduce anything into that um, system. When moving from contaminated to a clean location on the same patient, don't do the gangrene dressing on the toe and then insert the Foley catheter without doing hand hygiene. Actually, put the Foley in before you do the dressing. But if you happen to need to do it the reverse way, make sure that you're doing hand hygiene in between those two tasks. After contact with blood or other body fluids and after touching the patient's surroundings. And the patient's surroundings, again, are an extension of that patient because we touch the patient, we touch the surroundings, we touch the pump, the bedside table. Now that visitors are back, visitors are also doing the same thing. And again, if the only thing that you take away from here is gloves do not replace the need to perform hand hygiene, I've been successful. The num and again, the number one way to prevent the spread of infection is hand hygiene. So yes, we all know this. Florence Nightingale and Samuel Wise um, over 200 years ago identified that hand hygiene was the number one way to reduce infections, but yet we're still sitting here 200 years later having that same very conversation. The national average for hand hygiene is about 40%. So when you flip that number, that means that 60% of the time, patients are being taken care of with dirty hands. I know I don't want to be part of that 60%. So if you improve your compliance by 10%, think about how the patients will be that much safer. Artificial nails, nail jewelry are prohibited for all healthcare providers and workers who have the potential for exposure to infectious material. This includes acrylic, wraps, gels, dips, anything that is professionally put on and professionally removed. 
Nail, you should not have anything pierced or glued to the nail. Nails should be natural, no longer than one quarter inch in length. Um, the longer they are, the more difficult it is to clean underneath. Plus, they can become weapons for your elderly population. Nail polish must be kept clean and well manicured. And in patient care areas, jewelry should be kept to a minimum. Because think about it. When you're taking care of a patient, you're cleaning up a cold brown. And you those nice um, charm bracelets and it happens to dip through the gill. How do you clean that? And then you could be going from one patient to a patient, from a patient who may have, say, a MRSA infection, and then you're going to go take care of a patient that may have cancer. So you really want to make sure that you're paying attention to all of those things. Yes, we spend a lot of time on hand hygiene, and you're going to continue to hear this year after year until we get to 100% compliance, and it's part of our culture. We have the alcohol, there's two methods to perform hand hygiene. One is the alcohol-based hand foam and then soap and water. I will tell you there is appropriate time and place for soap and water, but I prefer the alcohol-based hand gel because soap and water, you have to wet your hands, get the soap, scrub vigorously in between all surfaces for 20 seconds. It's that friction that's bringing those germs to the surface after that 20 seconds you're going to rinse. When you rinse, you're going to get paper towels. You're going to dry your hands. More than likely, you're going to put it, and then you're going to turn the faucet off with that paper towel because you don't want to recontaminate your hands. You're probably going to put on gloves, so you're going to then um, dry your hands a little bit more. That's about 30 seconds. Who, in, who actually spends 30 seconds washing their hands? You have to consciously think about hand washing with soap and water to achieve that 30 seconds. Whereas if you have the alcohol-based hand foam, and I do love demonstrations, that's why this is very difficult for me because I like putting on the gowns and the masks and showing you different things that I see to show you a different way of looking at things. Hi, I'm Jen, the infection control manager here at St. Mary's Medical Center that I can talk and talk and talk about infection prevention all day long. Now, if you were the patient, you saw me do my hand hygiene. It's the same thing that you're looking for when you go into the doctor's office. You're looking to see, did the physician or the nurse do their hand hygiene because it makes you feel safe? Well, it makes our patients feel safe when they see you doing hand hygiene because most of the time when you're doing soap and water, you're away from the patient. You can also do your patent while doing your hand sand. Um, using the alcohol-based hand gel because you can pause, introduce, acknowledge, um, and I forget the other ones, but it all kind of goes hands in hand. So it's a time saver as well. And the amount that you get in the dispenser is the amount that you're supposed to get. It's smaller hands. Maybe it might be a little too much, but then larger hands, it may be not enough. But the intent is to still have to rub in the sanitizer for about 15 seconds. The, the benefit of it is it's easier to use and you can do it at the beds in the eyesight of the patient. You do have to use soap and water after you use in the bathroom, before eating, visibly soiled, and after patients with direct or indirect care of those diagnosed with C. diff. Why with C. diff do you have to use soap and water? And that's because nothing kills a C. diff spore other than bleach. And I'm sure that we don't want to use bleach on our hands. So the soap and water, that vigorous scrubbing brings the surf germs to the surface to rinse them down the drain. Recommendations to prevent multi-drug resistant organisms, hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene. I can't speak enough about hand hygiene because that's the biggest way that we transmit things between our hands and our equipment. You want to do regular disinfection of equipment and surfaces. We'll discuss um, the different products that we have and what the contact times are very shortly. You want to make sure that you're getting the cultures necessary for diagnosis early when you're talking about MRSA and C. diff. Um, you, we don't want to wait until several days into this day. One, we get hit with, if we don't collect it by day three of admission, it's considered a hospital-acquired infection. It doesn't matter how the patient presented to the facility, even if it was clinically present on admission. If we didn't collect the specimen until day four, it's hospital-acquired. In addition, you want to make sure not only for the fact that we get hit with a hospital-acquired infection, but we want the appropriate treatment as early as possible. Um, for multi-drug resistant organisms, 
alcohol-based hand gel is sufficient. Actually, it's very preferred as we already discussed it. And then we want to make sure that we're de-escalating the antibiotics appropriately as well. Standard precautions, what we do for every patient every time. Unfortunately, in today's world, our standard precautions have changed a little bit. It used to be just hand hygiene um, and then the appropriate use of PPE according to whatever task that you were using. Well, now standard precautions is also including the surgical mask and um, eye protection for all patient interaction. Um, safe injection practices are also included in that. Use for every person, every, every person, every time. Treat all blood and body fluids, secretions, excretions, not intact skin and mucous membranes as if they contain potentially infectious material so that we can reduce the risk of transmission of infectious organisms. You're going to have to splice a second. I'm sorry. Hold on. Don't stop. Mm -hmm. Can you put me on pause? Uh, don't count me down yet. I need to do one thing. Okay. Um, so, should I go to this slide? Would it be easier for you to cut in here? Yeah, just start from the beginning. Whichever, if you just finished with that slide, then go to the next one yeah, and get and start on that. Yeah, because this this one's finished. Okay. Yeah, we can go. We can start here. Hang on one second. Okay, I'm recording. Okay, so personal protective equipment. How many, so gloves, and actually I had gloves. Gloves are um, used when touching blood, body fluids, excretions, non-intact skin, mucous membranes, and contaminated items. They are single patient use. You do not wear them from patient to patient, room to room. Do not double glove. Do You cannot sanitize or wash gloves. No personal protective in the hallway unless needed for transport of cer in certain cases. In that situation, uh oh, teams hold buffering. the bag, and then you would have your free hand to turn doorknob. All right, for some reason, we're buffering and having problems with the network. So hang on. Stupid Wi-Fi. All right, go ahead and um, start from about, um, go ahead and start at the top. I'm sorry. Nope, that's okay. Single patient use, you do not wear them going from patient to Yeah, it keeps freezing up, Jen. Keeps freezing up. All right. Let's try again. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Damn it. About gloves. When when touching gloves are to be worn when touching. It's buffering too much. I don't know why, but it is. Doing it from home? Huh? Let me try something. Okay. Go ahead and start. Are you Personal protective equipment, gloves. 
when use gloves when touching blood, body fluids, excretions, non-intact skin, mucous membranes, and contaminated items. They're single patient use. Do not wear them from patient to patient or room to room. Do not double glove. Gloves cannot be sanitized or washed. There should be no PPE worn in the hallway unless needed for transport in certain cases, as in transporting a COVID patient and or biohazard material, say, to lab. And in that case, when you're transporting the biohazard bag, you're going to remove your gloves, do your hand hygiene, put on one clean glove to hold your bag. That way you have a clean hand to open up the doors or touch the elevator button. It's a perception. Even if you say, I just put them on, the perception is going to be that they're dirty. If you're transporting a patient from one unit to another that is COVID positive and you have to wear your PPE, you're going to want to have a designated person who can speak to, I'm opening the elevator buttons or opening the doors or touching the elevator buttons. Um, if, say, something gets contaminated, you want to make sure that you are then using the a hospital approved disinfectant to wipe that area down. You must perform hand hygiene for fire before applying and immediately removing gloves. Again, gloves do not replace the need to perform hand hygiene. Gowns. Gowns are intended to protect your skin and clothing for going patient to patient who we may or may not know that they have something or to protect our clothing from getting contaminated with bodily fluids. You want to make sure that you are tying the gown in the back. Otherwise, there is no sense in wearing the gown at all because you're then not protecting your clothing and skin. Besides, we would get tagged for a joint commission for not appropriately wearing our PPE. Masks. How many of you actually have read the directions on how to wear a surgical mask? Because I have, because pre-COVID, I got tired of nurses throwing the masks at me for when I would tell them to put the mask up. The mask goes over your ears. The ear loops goes over the ears. It goes over the nose. You mold it, and it goes underneath the chin. It does. This is up or off. Okay, it doesn't get worn underneath here. You don't hang it off your ear. When you remove it, throw it away and get a new one. This is a filter. It is preventing anything that you don't want to get into your lungs. It doesn't matter if you have a fever blister, that you're sick, the patient's sick. It doesn't matter why you're wearing it. It has to be up or off. With this being a filter, it gets hot and moist. So this area is dirty because all of those germs in the air that you're preventing from going into your lung is now here. So when I do this and I touch the front of the mask, does anybody want to shake my hands? No. So why do we do it to our patients all the time? We need to make sure that if we do touch the mask that we are doing our hand hygiene. Eye protection. Eye glasses are not considered eye protection. You have to have a full face shield or approved eye goggles um, to protect the mucous membranes because our eyes, nose, and mouth are entrances into the body. Cleaning equipment, low-level disinfection. You have non-critical reusable patient equipment, which is like your blood pressure machines, EKG machines, glucom glucometers, the wells, anything that does not come in contact with a mucous membrane. You want to clean between each patient use with a disinfectant wipe. The perp the orange is bleach. This is for every this is for C diff or the poopies. The purple is the alcohol-based one, which is for everything else except C diff. Your Orange top has a four minute contact time, wet time, kill time, whatever time that the Joint Commission wants to confuse you on. And the purple top has a two minute. So what does that mean? That means that you have to leave the surface wet for either four minutes or two minutes before allowing it to air dry. And that doesn't mean that you blow on it, you take a piece of paper and you wave it, you throw the the sheet on it like the ED does, and I love the emergency room. You guys do amazing things down there, but if you're taking that disinfectant and you're clean, um, drying it with the sheet, then you're not cleaning that surface. Do not blow. Do not use hand or a paper towel to dry it off. High-level disinfection. So now something that has come in contact with the mucous membrane or something, an instrument that needs to go back downstairs to be re-sterilized um, 
by central sterile. We have a very, this is very big with joint commission because we need to make sure that the instruments used at bedside remain wet from the point of use until the time it gets down to central sterile. So each facility has a, a process, get with your facility. This is the process that we developed at St. Mary's Medical Center. Um, our red bins have labels on top of it that actually says clean. Um, I'm missing the label on this one, but this red bin would then be stored in the clean utility. When you grab the red bin, you're going to grab a bottle of sterile water, not saline. Saline can pit the instruments. When you get to the bedside, you're going to open your red bin. You're going to take out the white cloth that's on the inside and you're going to wet it. You're going to take these nice scissors that I cut somebody's toe off. You're going to wipe any gross material, this wet cloth. You're going to used and unused instruments. You're going to lay inside the red bin. You're going to take the wet white cloth, cover it. You're going to close the red bin and take it to the dirty utility. We're in the dirty utility. We have the product called pre-cleanse. This can keep the instruments wet up to 72 hours. You're going to then reopen the bin. You're going to copiously spray with the pre-cleanse. After you remove the white cloth, you're going to copiously spray, making sure that the instruments are super saturated wet. You're going to then close the bin and either call SPD and tell them that you have an instrument to pick up, or you're going to take the red bin down to SPD, whichever case. They're going to then bring you or hand you a new clean red bin. The other thing is, is when you're transporting, make sure that you peel the clean to show the biohazard label. When you're doing procedures at the bedside, you want to make sure that you're looking at the outside packaging. Hold on, I'm sorry. I just want to get this away. Okay. You want to look at the outside packaging. You want to make sure that the outside um, tape because this shows it's been through the sterilization process that the red has turned to yellow or that the yellow has turned to black. If it has not, you want to send it back down to SPD. On the inside, there's also chemical indicators to making sure that the sterilization got all the way through the tray. So the white is going to turn to black. Now the black can be at any part of this green area. The red is going to turn to yellow. If it does not, again, take it back down to central sterile. You want to look at the blue wrapper to make sure that there's no holes in the wrapper, that there is no moisture inside the package. If anything is wrong, please send it back to central sterile and get another tray. So this is kind of in the wrong order, and I don't know how. Like... Hmm. We go from standard precautions to the PPE to cleaning, but now back to transmission and isolation. I don't know. That's the way that the PowerPoint was set up. So um, I don't know what happened. Something happened. So I'm going to do it, but can you splice it in different? I'll try. Yeah, I'll see what I can do. I, I may be able to. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah. I'll see what I can do. Sometimes I'm, I'm kind of new to this editing program, but I'm learning. So this would be a good way to learn on it. Okay. Because that's why when I got to the like, the high level, I'm like, um, where's my transmission-based stuff? <laughs> so, all right. So now we either know that the patient, all right, I'll hold, I'll hold for a second. So then that way it gives you a little bit of time. So now we either know that the patient has something or we suspect that they have something. We want to immediately at that time initiate isolation precautions. These are in addition to standard precautions. They can be initiated without a physician order. The nurse must enter the order and um, initiate the sign for communication. The sign on the doors are communication for ancillary staff. So please make sure that the sign matches what isolation precaution is required or removed when it is no longer needed. 
How many of us have taken care of a patient for two or three days or nights, and then the next day that you come in, they're on MRSA precautions? And you're like, oh, I took care of that patient for the last three days, and now they're on MRSA? Well, how do you think that phlebotomist feels when they come in to do the 4 a.m. Bl blood draws, but then at 7 a.m. when they come back for the troponin, it is now, on, that patient is now on MRSA precautions. You know, it's frustrating to them as well. So please make sure that the sign matches the appropriate as well as the orders entered into the computer. Transportation is limited to essential purposes only, and when possible, we try to dedicate non-critical care patient equipment. However, we understand that there is a limitation, and make sure that you clean the equipment in between each patient use. I'm not sure what color signs everybody has, because I do, I, for St. Mary's, like to teach the color signs, so then that way when you look at it, you know what um, isolations the patient is on. So for our normal contact precautions, it's green. Our enteric, which is the poopies, is brown. Code brown, brown. Um, so this is C. diff norovirus. This is more your MRSA, VRE, RSV, ESBL. Yes, RSV is contact, not droplet. It's contracted by surfaces, not breathing it in. For contact and enteric precautions, you have to come in physically contact, rub your eyes, pick your nose, and that's how it gets into your body. So the only difference between contact and enteric is what you do when you leave the room. Both going in, you need to wear a gown and gloves. And now because eye protection and surgical mask is part of all patient care, you're going to have eye protection surgical mask, gown, and gloves. You're going to, in so with regular contact, you're going to clean your equipment with the purple top wipe, allowing it to air stay wet for two minutes. Clean your hands with alcohol sanitizer. And tariff precautions, you have to clean your equipment with bleach and wash your hands with soap and water. So it's soap, water, bleach. When you see the brown, remember soap, water, bleach. And that's because it's either C. diff or norovirus. Droplet and airborne, droplet and airborne, you have to physically breathe it in. You're not going to necessarily get it from a surface. So you need to wear your, you don't need gown and gloves unless standard precautions tells you otherwise. The patient's had a big blowout and you need to protect your clothing. That would be the only time that you would actually need to wear your gown and gloves. The face mask is sufficient for droplet precautions, which technically everybody's on droplet precautions right now because it's required for all patient care. And I want to clarify, for all patient care, it has to be the surgical mask. It cannot be a cloth mask. It needs to be a surgical mask when you're in the clinical units. And some facilities actually are requiring the surgical mask throughout the entire facility. So check with your facility's policy on that. And again, it goes up over the nose and underneath the chin. You clean your equipment with the purple top PDI wipe and you perform hand hygiene using the alcohol-based foam. This drop of precautions pre-COVID was for influenza and meningitis. Airborne precautions is your suspected TB, confirmed TB, disseminated shingles. This is the N95. You have to have a negative pressure room and you must wear an N95. If you're not fit tested for an N95, then you cannot go into these rooms. And there are several entities within our facilities that are not fit tested, as in IT, volunteers, dietary. So please don't tell them it's okay to put a double mask on and to go into that room. The difference between droplet and airborne is the size of the molecule. Droplet, the molecule is much larger and stays suspended in the air for a shorter distance and time. Where airborne, I'm sorry, airborne, it's a much smaller molecule and it can stay in the air for much longer time and distances. So you're gonna wanna, you don't need to wear gown and gloves unless standard precaution tells you otherwise. Clean your equipment with the purple top and wash your hands with alcohol-based foam. Enhanced precautions or our COVID precautions. I think that they're going to stay around for quite some time. Again, it does require negative room when an aerosolizing generator 
procedure is being performed. The door must stay shut. You have to have eye protection, N95, isolation gown, and gloves to enter this room. You're going to clean your equipment with the purple top, and you're going to do your hand sit use hand sanitizer for your hand hygiene. Safe injection practices. You want to make sure that you're, when you're um, withdrawing medications from a vial or preparing your IV medications that you're using the designated clean area in your medication room, you must use proper hand hygiene, wear gloves, Use aseptic technique and scrub that hub, scrub the septum. Make sure that it's, you scrub it for the 15 seconds, allow it to dry. Once you put a needle in, once you access it with the needle, you don't reaccess with that same needle. Even if you didn't use it on a patient, it's a one time and done into that septum. Infusion sets and administration sets are for one patient only. They're changed, the primary tubing is changed every 96, secondary or intermittent tubing is changed every 24. Single dose vials do not reuse. Saline flushes are a one time and done. Don't use half, give your medicine and use the other half. It's once you've accessed it, throw it away, get a new one. Multi-dose vials, again, scrub that septum, one needle in, that's it, change your needle, and then single dose, one patient only, please don't share them. Once you open a multi-dose vial, please make sure that you're labeling it with the expiration date 28 days from the time of open. So why is this all important? We're trying to reduce hospital acquired infections, the caudies, clapsies, VAPs, SSIs, MRSA, bacteremias, and the C. diff. For CAUTI, the biggest thing that you can do is not insert the Foley catheter in the first place because if you don't have a Foley, you can't get a catheter-associated UTI. Please make sure that you're inserting based upon the appropriate criteria. Use a bladder scanner to assess and confirm urinary retention. Um, surgical procedures, IC, for accurate input and output, that is for your ICU patient unless um, because in a med surge telemetry area, typically they're not that critical that you need to know by the hour and you're changing um, the patient treatment based upon that intake and output. Urinary incontinence with open wounds. When we're talking open wounds, we're talking in the peri area. Just because I have a stage four in my elbow doesn't mean I need to have a Foley catheter. Prolonged immobilization. If I'm an old stroke and I live in a nursing home and I'm incontinent in the nursing home and you're not going to fix me when you're here, there's no need for that Foley catheter here. And then palliative care. Use alternatives. We have bedside commodes and urinals. We have external male catheters. Um, we have the male external catheter um, Texan condom kit, Texas catheter condom kit from Bard for here at St. Mary's Medical Center. I know one facility has... The Prima Fit, um, which is very similar to the Pure Wick. We have Pure Wicks for the female catheter. You can straight cat. Um, it is a sterile procedure. It requires two person for insertion. You want to make sure that you're doing your pre-clean before you do your aseptic insertion after you do your hand hygiene. You want to make sure that the catheter is secured with a stat lock. Maintain a free flow and then keep the bag below the level of the bladder, off the floor, no dependent loops and use fecal management symptom systems for incontinent patients with liquid stools. The goal is to get it out as soon as possible just because grandma needed it today doesn't mean that she's gonna need it tomorrow. So make sure that you're doing that assessment. Make sure you're doing your peri care at least every shift, if not more frequently as necessary. And get those um, preoperative or the intraoperative Foley's out as soon as possible, especially within the first 24 hours. Clapsies. Um, we, I, I know here at St. Mary's Medical Center, we have a vascular access team that um, can do power glides and pick lines. Um, get your vascular access team involved early on to place the appropriate line. Don't ask for a central line um, unless absolutely necessary. If you're having issues with insertion of peripherals, I know our vascular team here can assist with that um, because 
the longer the second that you place a line in that puts a patient at risk for an infection the longer that line is in the higher risk for infection at the time of insertion be that patient's advocate make sure that the patient is covered from head to toe if the physician that is inserting or the person inserting the line has forgotten their hat say hey did you want me to get your hat for you um but be that patient's advocate if speak up if the sterility has not been maintained once the line is in place, you want to make sure that it remains clean, dry, and intact. Here at St. Mary's Medical Center, our vascular access team is responsible for all routine care and maintenance when it comes to all central lines, excluding the infusive ports. Um, however, if that dressing is not intact or the integrity is compromised, please don't wait for the PIC team. We are all nurses. We need to make sure that we are changing that dressing as soon as possible. Scrub the hub. 15 15 to 30 seconds every single time. Use alcohol to scrub the hub, making sure that you allow it to dry. We no longer use BioPatch. All of, we have switched to the 3M impregnated um, chlorhexidine dressings. Please make sure that there is a chlorhexidine dressing in place. Saline flushes, again, are never to be reused. And every patient that actually has a device is to get a CHG bath and assess daily for de-escalation of Foley or of central lines. But also, de-escalate, if the patient has three peripheral IVs, do you really need to have three peripheral IVs? Because you can get an infection from a peripheral IV just as well as you can a central line. And if a patient has both, that central line is going to get tagged with that infection. So we want to get out, um, remove any lines that are not being used. You want to flush the lines, every any line that's not being used every single day or every single shift. I apologize. Um, Make sure that you're labeling your tubing and changing your tubing appropriately. When central lines using the orange scrub caps or swab caps to protect that port. Ventilator associated pneumonias, hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene. Um, vacation sedations, elevate the bed, oral hygiene. Every two hours that patient should have oral hygiene. Peptic ulcer disease prophylaxis and coordinate with and involve your RT. Surgical site infection, they do all kinds of things. They get a CHG bath. They're going to make sure that they get antibiotics. And within 30 minutes, they're going to maintain glucose, um, VTE prophylaxis. They're going to clip hair. They are not going to shave hair because when you shave, it creates little abrasions that bacteria can get in. And when they actually do their cut, it can push that bacteria down into the incision. Um, and, and they want to make sure that there's normothermia pre, intra, and post operatively, and they remove that fully on post op day number one. MRSA and C. diff, we kind of talked about this already, making sure that you're getting your specimens. Oops, sorry about that. Um, all right, so I'm going to hold off a minute and then so you can resplace. Okay. MRSA, bacteremia, and C. diff, we've already discussed, making sure that you're getting the specimens. Um, before day four, because thereafter it is considered hospital acquired, you also want to make sure that the appropriate treatment. What can you do? No matter who you are, what your role is. You want to do hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene. You want to comply with standard and transmission-based precautions. Respiratory etiquette, cough into your chicken wing, not into your hand. Cough each... Um, Call with suspicion or knowledge of an infectious patient. We don't always know who is on isol or why somebody is on isolation based because we don't necessarily see a positive culture. So if a patient has chicken pox, we don't necessarily know that that patient has chicken pox. Or if they're suspecting TB and we don't have a positive, say, AFB smear, we wouldn't know that. So please make sure that you're calling us and letting us know um, of any infectious pa patients. Call with questions or concerns regarding infection control issues. I can tell you for myself, I'm very anonymous because there's only two of us here and it takes a village, you know? So if you're concerned with something, you can come to me. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, well, you know, Rosie, John told me you don't like to do hand hygiene. I may go a couple days later, even a week later and say, hey, Rosie, a little birdie told me that you're struggling with hand hygiene. What can I do to help? What is it? Do you not like the product? Is the dispenser in the wrong place? Um, what is it that I can do to help you to be compliant? So please, you know, we need your assistance as well because we can't be everywhere all the time. 
and be the patient advocate. Speak up. Because if that was your parent or your brother or your sister or the most important person laying in that bed, you would want to know that behind the scenes, there's somebody making sure that all the practices and evidence-based practices are being put into place to make your loved one safe. We need to do that same very thing for other loved ones, even when no one is watching. Uh, welcome aboard. Good luck to you. If you have any questions, oh, I keep forgetting about these slides. What is wrong and what should you do? So this is a sharps container that actually has tape. Tape is not our friend. You can't clean tape and it leaves a residual that it's very difficult to clean that we can transmit bacteria. So we wanna get that tape removed. Holes in the walls is an infection control issue because there is things in the walls that there's bacteria. We don't wanna take somebody's dirty, this is a Dynamap with a, a trash bag on it. We don't wanna take somebody's dirty stuff from room to room. Um, this is a wow that actually I think is just a normal, good-looking wow. I don't see anything necessarily wrong because there's no HPI. I'm not seeing tape. Um, this is blood on this Sharps container, so we need to wipe that up with a orange top PDI wipe immediately. These The PDI tops need to stay closed because it does dry out. And then linen, even if it's in a clean utility, it must remain covered unless it's being stored all by itself. So please make sure that the linen stays covered. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to your fashion preventionist at your facility. They are there for you to help drive practices. We can't prevent the infection. All we can do is provide you with the tools and the guidance of how to do it. So please, please, please utilize your infection prevention to the best of your ability. Thank you. And those are the references that um, where all the evidence-based practices came from.